This video is brought to you by Moft. So you've just got your brand new iPad. First of all, congratulations. Today I'm gonna to share with you the first 10 things that you should do to get the most out of your iPad in terms of its features, performance, as well as the battery life. This video is going to apply to all recent iPad models from the iPad, iPad Air, and the iPad Pro. As always guys, I will leave all the purchase links down in the description. Okay, so to start, let's take a look at some essential gestures. Now, while you may know the basics, we're gonna walk through those as well as some really cool shortcuts uh, that I'm pretty sure you probably didn't know about. So first guys, let's take a look at closing an app. Now let's open up settings here. Uh, to close an application, you're gonna want to swipe up from the bottom of the display or basically wherever you see this bar. Now this bar will move depending on whether you're in portrait or in landscape mode. So when you see this bar, simply swipe up to close that app. Now, an alternative way to close an application is is to use a five finger pinch. So I'm gonna take five of my fingers and kind of pinch outwards to instantly close the app as well. But I'd say one of my favorite uh, gestures or shortcuts rather is let's say we open up settings again uh, to quickly switch between multiple recent open apps. What you can also do is take four fingers and then swipe to the left or the right of the display. And as you can see, I'm just switching between my two or three most recent applications. Super useful. Once again, four fingers swipe from the left or the right. And then while you're in an application to view your other open apps, what we're gonna do is swipe up and then hold, and this will bring up the multitasking menu. And as you can see, this will give you a snapshot of all of your open applications. Again, this is great to switch between open apps, but also a great way to restart an app that may be acting up or kind of glitching. So what you can do, let's say here I have iTunes, uh, let's say that's been acting kind of slow or weird. What I can do is simply swipe up to move it off the display and this will permanently close the application uh, and effectively restart it when we open it again. So oftentimes, if an app is acting a bit strange, uh, this will be the fix. And then back on the home screen, if we swipe down from the top middle, we'll open up the notification shade. So all of your notifications uh, will be here. Also things like your media controls, if say you're playing music in the background. And then if we swipe from the top right corner, we'll open up the control center. Now in a sec, I'm gonna actually show you how to customize this, but this is a great way to access those core system functions. You got your volume, brightness, as well as your connectivity, uh, as well as of course your media controls right here in the control center. And this can be accessed both from the home screen uh, as well as within apps. The last gesture I want to show you is one that has to do uh, with whilst being in another app. So let's go ahead and open up one of our recent apps here. Let's go to the app store uh, and let's say I want to pull up my dock. Now the dock here is this part of the home screen in which you have this section over here, which will have your three most recent apps. And then over here, you can have a myriad of apps uh, that you will have permanently placed. And you can edit and modify this. We'll show you this later. Uh, but let's say you want to pull up the dock specifically whilst in a different app. What you can do is actually swipe from the bottom of the display and then sort of swipe up just a bit. When you're closing an application, you want to swipe up further, but when you want to pull up the dock, just swipe up ever so slightly. And as you can see, the dock will appear. And this right, uh, this right corner here in particular is useful because it will show you your recent apps. And chances are you're going to want to switch between some other recent apps. So here you have iTunes, back to the App Store, back to iTunes. And again, to pull it up, it's just a slight swipe up from the bottom of the screen. Very useful. Speaking of useful, I think one of the most powerful features of the iPad is not only being able to quickly switch between open apps like we just looked at, but more so it is being able to actually run multiple apps at once through split screen as well as through slide over. And this to me gives the iPad much more of a computer feel uh, and really uh, enables much more productivity uh, and functionality from this powerful device. So let's take a look and see how this is done. Uh, so to give you an example, let's say here I am browsing the web. I have a Safari window open uh, and let's say I want to take some notes. So what I can do is tap these three little dots you'll find in the top middle uh, of your window. And this will give us two options, either split screen or slide over. Now we're going to start off uh, with split view. So we'll take a look at that first. And as you can see, that's going to slide the application over to the left uh, where we can now open a second application to have side by side. So let's say notes here and go ahead and open that. And as you can see, we're now actually running two apps at the same time. This is really cool. So while we're browsing the web, we can go ahead and tap uh, and we can type up some notes while we are doing, let's say some product research as I often do as a content creator. Uh, and you can effectively run two apps at the same time. By the way, press this button here uh, to hide the keyboard, get more screen space. Now you can actually also uh, change the, uh, the view here. So you take this little middle bar here and you can actually move that to the left 
or the right to sort of uh, change the uh, proportions of the display here. So you want to prioritize, say, more space to the notes or more to Safari, you can do so as well. Uh, and you can also keep it, of course, centered to keep a 50-50 split. Now, this mode will work both in landscape as well as in portrait mode. Uh, my suggestion would be to use it in landscape mode as it's just a more natural way to evenly divide the display. Also, if you want to rearrange the applications, you can simply click and drag on the three dot menu. And as you can see, that will then rearrange the app. So depending on uh, which you prefer to have on one side or the other. Now to close an application, of course, to close both, you can swipe down from the bottom, but to close one of the two instances, we'll tap on that three dot menu. And then we have the option to close. And as you can see, that's then gonna uh, full screen Safari once again. And if we want to pull up a different app, it's just like before, tap the three dot menu uh, and select the split screen view. But split view is not the only way to multitask on your iPad. There is also slide over. So let me show you how this works. Uh, so first I'm gonna open up, let's say the music application and I'm gonna tap on the three dot menu. And this time we're gonna select slide over and it's gonna slide the application this time to the right of the screen. And we're then gonna open up a second application to open in the background. So in this case, uh, let's take a pages document. So as you can see, it kind of distributes uh, the apps a little bit differently as opposed to a split screen model. Uh, you have one overlaid over the other where one one clearly gets more screen space, in this case, the Pages app in the background. And we have this sort of mini, almost iPhone size view of the music app, which we can then move around, as you can see, using the three dot menu. And we can also slide it entirely off screen. And this gives us full room to work on the Pages document uh, and more comfortably type out text. But then if we quickly want to access our music again, all you have to do is swipe from the right of the screen and this will bring up this small viewer, allowing you to quickly access uh, your music, say change a song uh, whilst you are working on your thesis in the background. So this is a, a different way to essentially multitask on your iPad. And I love how you can move this around. You can instantly move it off screen bring it back whenever you like, uh, a great way to quickly access another application uh, whilst working in your main app. And then if you wanna close the slide over app, simply tap on the three dot menu, and then we have the close option there. Uh, and that will then close the application and just leave us with the pages document, swipe up to go back home. Now, most of the iPad tips and tricks that we look at today are gonna to be software related, except for this one. The iPad can be used in many different situations from productivity to as a secondary display and even as your main workstation. However, to truly enable all these different use cases, you need a good folio. And this is where the Snap Float Folio from Moft comes in. It uses an origami design that can be set up in three modes and instantly adapted to match your situation. My favorite mode is the floating mode. Now, if you use your iPad uh, like me as a secondary display or even as your primary machine, this mode is a game changer because it raises the display, making it much more comfortable to use effectively raising the iPad to meet you at eye level. And this makes it so much more comfortable for your neck and back. Check out the before and after. I think it looks better too. And next is the focus mode. Now the focus mode is especially great, say for watching videos uh, or setting up your iPad in tighter spaces. And then finally, there is also of course the drawing mode, which sort of angles your iPad to a more ergonomic uh, angle, making it much more comfortable to draw. I especially like that Moft Folio is also compatible with their Snap case. And this is great because the Snap case offers a really convenient place to store your Apple Pencil. The Snap Float Folio uses a one piece design that is made of this Neo leather, which is scratch resistant and fingerprint resistant, so it will hold up well over time. I like how it also retains the iPad's auto sleep wake feature. To get the most out of your iPad and add functionality to it with the Snap Float Stand from Moft, be sure to head to the links in the description and use code DEON10 for 10% off your order. So next, uh, let's take a look at this display. Now the iPads come with a really great display, uh, which is of course essential for consuming and creating your content, but there are ways to customize and optimize the display. So let's jump into the settings app here. Uh, we're gonna scroll down to where we find display and brightness. The first option we have here is to switch between your light and dark mode. Now, personally, I think both modes have their advantages and disadvantages. So I like to use both depending on the time of day. And this is where you can permanently uh, cycle between them if you'd like, or you can actually have it set to a schedule like I do. So as you can see, uh, I turn on the automatic option here, and then we can have it set to either the uh, sun position of the sun or to a specific time. Now I like sunset, sunrise. I love using my iPad in the evening, uh, especially before going to bed. Not great for sleep, but still nice uh, nonetheless. Uh, but at least my display will be in dark mode. It's just a little bit more pleasing to the eyes uh, as opposed to during the day, like now, where I like the screen to be nice and bright uh, in which I keep it in light mode. 
If we go back, uh, here we have your uh, brightness toggle. You will also find this in the control center. So swipe down from the top right and then you can quickly adjust the brightness in there. Now, I've had some questions in the past uh, about turning off auto brightness as this is something that is uh, enabled by default on the iPad, something I do recommend you keep on, especially for battery uh, for battery life. Of course, you will look at more battery saving tips uh, later on in this video. So be sure to stay tuned for that. But if you do want to turn off your auto brightness for whatever reason, uh, what you can do is go into accessibility and then we're going to go to where we find display. Uh, there it is, display and text. And then we have the option for auto brightness here on the bottom. Now, currently I have it off for my video, uh, but for whatever reason, if you want to keep it off as well, you can do it there. Alternatively, you can also ask Siri. So we're going to go ahead and enable Siri here, turn off auto brightness. As you can see, it will then turn off the setting as well. In the same way, uh, we can also ask Siri to turn it back on. Just beneath the brightness toggle, we have True Tone. Now, just to show you what this does, I'm just going to turn it off. And as you can see, my display, when I turn it off, gives sort of a, um, a more hueish blue, bluish hue to it. Uh, makes it a little bit cooler to look at, as opposed to turning it on, which gives it a slightly more warmer tinge. And that's exactly what True Tone does. It will actually uh, change the temperature of the display to match your surroundings. So I've got studio lights, uh, daylight lights around me. And as you can see, when I turn it on, it gets ever so slightly warmer. And this, I think, makes the display more comfortable to look at. So it's something I generally do keep on. However, uh, the iPad is great for editing photos. In fact, I love editing, uh, editing photos in Lightroom. But whenever I do so, I always make sure to turn off True Tone as of course this does affect the colors of the display and thus also affects the accuracy. So if you want to edit content on your iPad, you of course want the most realistic view and color reproduction, in which case definitely make sure to turn off True Tone temporarily. Similarly to True Tone, we have Night Shift. Now, Night Shift kind of takes what True Tone does, but goes one step further by actually limiting the amount of blue light that comes from the display. So if I manually enable this, you can see we get sort of a orange look on the screen. Uh, this may be a little bit jarring at first, but believe me, in the evening, this is really nice to have on. Uh, blue light can actually interfere with your sleep. It can give people headaches uh, for some. So having this function on will limit the blue light from the display. Uh, so especially at night, I like to turn this on. And you can see I have mine scheduled here as well from 10 to 7. Uh, again, don't use this while you're editing photos or videos. But if you're just generally browsing content or especially reading, this is nice to have on. The last couple of settings here, uh, the first is auto lock. So you do have the option to turn this to never unless you have a very specific reason for doing so. My suggestion is to never keep it on never. Yes, double negative, uh, but don't keep it on negative uh, on never. And the reason for that is it one, it will drain your battery and two, it can actually harm the display and shorten the general life of your iPad. Keeping the display on at all times is no good. So I definitely suggest you uh, decrease the amount of time to anywhere from five to two minutes or so uh, for battery, but also for security reasons. If say ever you leave your iPad on a desk uh, unattended, uh, you wanna make sure that screen locks uh, to protect your personal data. Now I wanna take a closer look at the control center. Now this is what we previously looked at. So again here, that's in the top right corner of the display. Uh, very useful to have. I access this probably multiple times, whichever app I'm in, just a quick way to access those core system functions uh, at all times. Now, if we are in the settings app here and we scroll down to the control center tab, we do have the option to customize this and really make this your own. So the first setting we have actually is to allow access within apps. Now, when you turn this off, this means you won't be able to access it whilst in another application and only from the home screen. Now, I personally like to have this on as I always like to have it near at hand, but if say you are a mobile gamer and you are swiping frequently from the corners of the display, you don't suddenly want your game to be interrupted by the control center, uh, in which case you do have the option to turn that off. And then beneath that is where we find all of the included controls. Now, these are the ones that we currently have, and we can actually rearrange them using this little hamburger menu. So we can go ahead and arrange them. Uh, now, what you're actually modifying is sort of this lower half portion of the control center. This top portion here is fixed, but these bottom, uh, this bottom portion can be changed and modified. So my suggestion is actually to keep the most commonly used functions here on the bottom of the display, uh, as I find these are more distinctive and most easy to find. So that's what I've done. I've done my most important ones here on the bottom, which is that bottom four. And then here we have more controls to add. So let's say, uh, let's say I wanna add the torch. Uh, I don't think the iPad actually has a flash, but we have that option here on the bottom. We go ahead and swipe and move that around uh, like so. And as you can see, because it's at the bottom, It'll just be added there on the list. So highly recommend going through, uh, seeing which options you use, which you don't to kind of clean it up, declutter, and make sure you only have uh, what's actually important to you. So now I wanna take a closer look at the home screen. Uh, of course, really important. And over the past years, Apple has added a bunch of new ways to customize this uh, to really make it your own. So first to move an application, uh, what you're gonna do is press and hold on any given app on your home screen. The secondary menu will then come up uh, and then we can press the 
edit home screen button. And as you can see, all the applications start to kind of jiggle uh, and we can then go ahead and freely move them around. So I can rearrange them. Uh, if say I wanna move an app to a different page, just simply bring it to the edge of the screen here. This will then put it on the next page over and I can create a new page by simply bringing it once again to the edge uh, and that will bring it to a, uh, a completely blank page. So very nice to be able to quickly arrange your apps. Uh, still, I would love to be able to just randomly place apps as opposed to having that fixed grid um, chronological order, but still uh, it goes a long way to being able to customize your layout. Now you can also delete an application by pressing this little minus button here in the top left corner. And here we have two options. So the first is to delete the application. And as the name suggests, this will uh, not only hide it from your home screen, it will also remove it and its uh, associated contents from the iPad. So a good way to clear up storage, especially for apps that you don't use. Uh, but then secondly, we have the option to remove it from the home screen. Now removing it from the home screen will hide the application on your home screen but the app will still be visible uh, and accessible via the app library. And this is the screen right here that you'll find on the very end of your uh, home screen. So if you swipe all the way to the right, this will come up and this will give you an extensive list of all of your applications that are on your iPad, including the ones that you have hidden from your home screen. So say you have any sensitive applications, uh, perhaps finance related, something like that, uh, you can go ahead and uh, designate those just to the app library. And this brings me to widgets. So as you can see on my home screen, I actually have two. So I got the weather here uh, and my music widget. Uh, really cool to have some widgets. I think it's a great way to get information at a glance without having to open an application, especially on a larger screen, like on the iPad, uh, you have a lot more room to do so. And you can see that widgets can actually display quite a bit of information. But to add a new widget, uh, once again, we're gonna select on any app or widget for that matter and select that same edit home screen button. And this time we're gonna click on the little plus sign in the top of the display. And this is gonna give you an extensive list of all widgets that you can add. So here we have all kinds of applications that are on your iPad that support widgets, both first and third party. Uh, and we can go ahead and add a new widget. So let's take a look at battery here. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and take a look here and you can see that we have different sizes to choose from. Now, depending on the size of the widget, it's going to determine how much or little information it can show. Of course, the bigger the widget, the more info it shows, but the more, uh, the more space it will take up on your home screen. So uh, let's take this battery widget here and go ahead and add that. As you can see, that's just been added in the home screen and I can go ahead and move that just like an application, uh, kind of move it freely. Now, as you can see, I have two widgets here of the same size and let's say I want to keep both, but I don't want them both taking up space. This is where stacks come in. So what I can do is take two widgets of the same size, drag them on top of each other, and that's just created a stack. And as you can see, that's gonna allow me to manually cycle between the two widgets. So as you can see, depending on what I'm doing, or I can even schedule this to a time of day, I can have different widgets show. This is really useful as again, it doesn't take up more screen space than having one, but still gives you the functionality of two. Now let's take a look at the Apple Pencil. Now it is important to know uh, that some features that we'll be looking at today will be specific uh, or unique to the Apple Pencil 2 and not available on the older Apple Pencil 1. And some will also be unique to the iPad Pro and not to the other models. However, most of what I'll be showing you will apply to both models of the Apple Pencil uh, and all iPad models. All in all, I actually think the Apple Pencil is a really powerful iPad accessory. Uh, and I say that even as someone who has horrible handwriting uh, and who actually prefers to type. But for other features, uh, for example, generally navigating the iPad, I find the Apple Pencil just to be really useful. Uh, and especially when doing finer things like photo editing, but you can also annotate uh, all kinds of features. We'll look at today, uh, really a lot of reason to, uh, a lot of things to like here with the Apple Pencil. And if you already have an iPad, I think this is a great addition, especially the second generation Apple Pencil is it just magnetically charges on the side of the iPad, super seamless uh, and is a really powerful tool to have. So to give you an idea of what the Apple Pencil is capable of uh, and some of its best features and use cases, uh, let me show you what it can do in a notes document. So I've got a blank, uh, blank notes document open here. And as you can see on the bottom of the display, we'll get this new menu. And this is a menu specifically for the Apple Pencil, which will allow us to uh, choose the different brush types as well as different tools. And you can actually move this menu around the display just to make sure it doesn't interfere uh, with wherever you're working. So you can see uh, we can select a pen, for example, we can then tap on an individual tool, change things like the opacity, the thickness of the stroke. Uh, and we can then also use things like a highlighter. This is great if you're say annotating a document, a PDF, something like that. Uh, and then of course we also have the eraser tool. So we can tap that to uh, erase a portion 
of what we just drew. Uh, and you can actually also double tap on the pencil and that will then also change the tool. So you can see we're switching between the highlighter and the eraser, a double tap will allow you to quickly do so. So very useful, uh, sort of a hands-off approach rather than having to uh, touch the display. Uh, a really cool tool as well is we can actually bring in a ruler. So if you take your second hand, we can actually use two fingers to reposition that ruler. And then with the Apple Pencil, go back to the uh, highlighter here, I can go ahead and draw along the ruler. And as you can see, I'm not drawing straight, but the line will come out perfectly straight. So again, great if you're highlighting, underlining uh, lines of sentences, text and whatnot. Uh, speaking of which, you can actually also draw perfect shapes with the Apple Pencil. Uh, so let me go ahead and clear up some space here. So let's say I'm gonna draw a pretty rough circle, but then if I press and hold, as you can see, it will then correct it to a much cleaner shape. And it will not only do that with circles, it will also do it with triangles, as you can see. There we go. Uh, and even things like an arrow. So I'm gonna take this arrow here. There we go. And that creates a much better arrow. It looks much neater. Uh, hard to believe this is done by hand. And well, let's just say it, uh, it, it is semi done by hand. And then the last feature uh, I wanna show you in the Notes app specifically is to be able to annotate or to sign a document. So if we go ahead and tap here on this little A button here, we have the option to add a text box as well as a signature. And I will show you all of your stored signatures. Go ahead and add a new one. Uh, press a little plus sign here. I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, roughly write out my name. Let's say that's a signature. It is not, but we go, go ahead and pretend it is. We can then resize it and then reposition it and sign a PDF uh, or a document like that right from the iPad. This is easier to do on an iPad uh, than it is on any normal desktop or laptop. And then specifically to the new iPad Pro is the hover feature. Now you may have already uh, noticed this working in the Notes app where I could sort of see where the pencil would touch before I even touch the display. Uh, but this can be used for multiple features, also to preview photos in your library. You can see even here on the home screen as I hover over an application, I'm not touching them. It will show you which app you have selected. So a nice little quality of life feature, nothing I think groundbreaking, but is nice to have, especially if you are on the newer iPads. Uh, and I think the second best really, or one of the best use cases for the Apple Pencil is annotating screenshots. So I've just taken a screenshot, by the way, that's with the sleep wake button and the volume up button. And you can see that screenshot just appeared, well, just disappeared, just appeared on the bottom left of the display. Go ahead and tap into it. Again, we have that same pencil menu. Uh, this will then allow us to annotate. And this is where, again, those perfect shapes really come in so I can much more neatly go ahead and add an arrow uh, and then I can go ahead and type or write rather hello there we go so much neater way to annotate uh, a PDF or a PDF or say a screenshot uh, even if you're someone like me who has well pretty atrocious handwriting now, throughout the duration of this video, uh, you will have seen a keyboard here on the right. And there's a reason for that. I'm actually gonna show you how to pair not just a keyboard, but also a mouse to the iPad. Now, I wanna make clear that I think the iPad is actually at its best on its own like this, as a touch first device, uh, perhaps with an Apple Pencil on the side, but depending on your use case, having a keyboard and a mouse certainly doesn't hurt and does open new functionality for the iPad. Uh, also, I think this is a much more cost-effective way of bringing a proper keyboard to the iPad. You may be thinking about Apple's Magic Keyboard for the iPad. I have actually done a full review on that video. While it is good at what it does, I find it hard to justify the incredibly high price. A much more cost-effective version is to just take a normal keyboard. So here I have a Magic Keyboard that actually came from an iMac uh, and a third-party mouse. This is not even an Apple mouse. Uh, the keyboard, by the way, also does not have to be iPad or an Apple keyboard as long as it is Bluetooth. We can go ahead and pair it to the iPad and let me show you how this is done. So let's start off with the keyboard here. Now, first you're gonna wanna make sure that your keyboard is on and then in pairing mode. Now, depending on the keyboard, uh, we'll either automatically enter this or you may need to like press a, a pairing button on the back. Uh, once it is in that mode, we're gonna open up the settings menu and then we're gonna scroll to where we find Bluetooth here along the top. And then we're gonna wait for other devices and there your keyboard should show. So in this case, I have a magic keyboard. Go ahead and tap that and let that connect. Now, gonna give it a second here to connect. As you can see, it has just connected. And right now, right now the keyboard is ready to use. So uh, one of the things that's really cool, let me actually first open up a, a notes document here just to show you that I am in fact typing off my keyboard. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in, hello. I am now typing off the magic keyboard for iPad. There we go. Uh, what is also really cool is that a lot of the uh, function keys, now this will depend on which keyboard you have, but on the Apple Magic Keyboard uh, will still work. So for example, I can still adjust the volume. You can see it's moving up and down. I can adjust the brightness uh, and even other shortcut apps, like for example, the Spotlight, go and tap that to quickly search an uh, search throughout my iPad. By the way, another way to do this is press Command and then Space. Uh, and I can also use probably my favorite shortcut, uh, Command Tab. And this will allow me to quickly switch between all of my open apps. As you can see, take it right back to the home screen back to my app like so, back to settings, very quickly 
Uh, and this is a great way, especially if you're writing out, say, longer emails or a thesis or something like that, an additional keyboard uh, is really nice to have and it's super easy to set up. Great, so now that we've set up a keyboard, let me show you how to set up a mouse. Now, again, just like with the keyboard, you don't need to use an Apple mouse. Uh, in fact, please don't use the Apple mouse. I think the third-party mouses are much better, especially the Logitech MX Master 3, uh, by far my favorite mouse. But it's basically the same procedure. So you're gonna want to turn it on, make sure it is in pairing mode. There we go. So it just starts uh, ra rapidly blinking, and as you can see, it will now turn into pairing mode, and we can find it there, MX Master 3. Give it a second to pair. Request to pair. Yes, go ahead and pair that. And any second now, let's see, there we go. So the mouse is now paired. And as you can see, we have a proper cursor on the display. Now this is a relatively recent addition to the iPad uh, and is an absolute game changer as it really allows you to control the entire iPad just with a mouse. You can see that uh, it's not a traditional cursor in a sense that what you get is this little round opaque circle and you kind of have a hover feature similarly to the Apple Pencil where it will kind of preview uh, before you select what you're clicking on, especially in settings, I find this to be useful uh, as well. You can also of course adjust just this in your uh, keyboard settings and mouse settings. Uh, I also really like that the scroll function is retained. So you can see I'm scrolling and this still works. And the MX Master 3 has sort of two modes for scrolling uh, and both work on the iPad. And I really like how you don't need to touch the screen as this effectively turns it into a proper desktop setup, especially when you combine it with that keyboard. Uh, and of course, with the stab, uh, snap stand folio from Moff that we looked at earlier. And what you get altogether is pretty, uh, pretty much a mobile desktop setup, which if the iPad is gonna be your primary device is pretty cool. Okay, so now I wanna bring it back to some battery saving settings. Now the iPad actually has really good battery life out of the box, but you can take this much further or even further rather uh, by changing some settings. Now, first is changing the Siri settings. Now Siri, I think is really useful in general, uh, especially for example, on the Apple Watch, uh, but also on the iPad, uh, but how you access Siri does matter. So if, you, uh, if we go into the settings app here, we're gonna scroll to where we find Siri. There we go, Siri and search. Uh, and chances are you're gonna have this listen for, hey, I'm not gonna say the final word to trigger your series, uh, but if you have this option on, as you can see, it will be on now, the iPad will be constantly listening for this activation phrase. And this is going to take a battery as it will be listening for that uh, whenever you use your iPad or even when you're not using it. And while it is a fast way to bring up Siri, a very hands-free uh, way to do so, again, it does take up significant battery over time. My suggestion is to turn this off and instead trigger Siri by using, uh, by press and holding the top button. So that's what I did earlier in the video as well. We're gonna press and hold. What's the weather for today? And as you can see, that's not gonna bring up Siri just like normal uh, and give me the disappointing cloudy weather here in London. Next, we're gonna take a look at notifications. Now, if you've seen any of my uh, iPhone or Apple Watch related guide videos, you, this will be familiar to you. Uh, but just like on those devices, on the iPad too, every application is gonna to want to send you notifications. Uh, even ones that have no business doing so, uh, shopping apps, games, things like this, don't need to be bothering you throughout the day. Uh, and again, not only is this good for your mental well being, as again, this is less distractions throughout the day, it is also good for your battery, as your screens are gonna go off less and you're gonna have less data, less notifications coming in. So my suggestion is to go through this list of all of your applications and then manually select which apps you do or don't want to have you uh, to send you notifications. So for example here, App Store does not need to be sending me notifications. Go ahead and turn that off entirely and like vice versa. You can see I have the majority are actually off here on my iPad. Highly recommend you do the same, both good for your well-being uh, and also your battery life. And the same can be said for background app refresh. So if we go into the uh, general tab here and then select background app refresh, you'll see that almost all applications uh, by default will want to refresh in the background. Uh, most don't need to, again, unless it's apps uh, that you say use often, other apps like for example, shopping applications, certain games uh, or, or productivity apps may not need to. So I, while there, you do have the option to turn it off for all applications, I don't suggest doing this as some are useful to have refresh in the background, for example, your mail, uh, maps if you use that, uh, or for example, uh, content like streaming apps like Netflix or YouTube to so you sort of uh, know where you're at if you ever close the app and not have to you know refresh the episode and kind of figure out where you were. Uh, but generally speaking, a lot of apps you can also turn off. And again, it's a good way to save some battery. Just as important, if not more important than battery saving tips are some security tips. So what we're gonna do uh, for this is we're gonna scroll down here on the left in your settings app to where we find face ID and passcode. I'm gonna quickly type in my passcode and this will give you the option to either set up face ID or touch ID. Now, which version you have will depend on the iPad you have. So for example, the iPad Pro will have face ID, which is the one I have here. Uh, the iPad Air, however, will have touch ID and the same goes 
for the regular iPad. Now, whichever you have, I highly recommend you use this uh, some form of biometric authentication as not only is it very easy and seamless, I find it to work very well, both Face ID as well as Touch ID. Uh, it is also very effective at protecting your personal data, which is of course very important. Now, a useful tip uh, I have for uh, both Face ID as well as Touch ID is ever you, uh, if say you want to share your iPad with your significant other, a roommate or family member, whatever, um, if say you have Face ID, you do have the option to turn on an alternative appearance and you can actually have an entirely separate person set up Face ID here. And this is sort of a hack or sort of a workaround uh, to get Face ID to recognize multiple people. Uh, and if say you have Touch ID, what you can do is add up to five fingers. And this means you can technically uh, add five different people, right? Everyone has their own finger, own hand, uh, take everyone's index finger uh, or thumb, for example, and you can have multiple people access your iPad, at least of course, uh, people that you trust. If we scroll down in this page, uh, we have one of the most important things that I see so many people overlook, and I always remind them of this uh, when I see this, and that is to disallow access to all of these functions when your iPad is locked. Now, when your iPad is locked, essentially you don't want any of your personal information to be accessible. This includes your today view, especially your notifications, things like Siri, as a lock can be done with Siri uh, without even unlocking your iPad or returning calls, any kind of controls or access to uh, accessories. Like for example, someone plugs this into a computer. My my suggestion is turn all of these off. As you can see, uh, if I go and turn off or lock my iPad, nothing can be accessed, not my notifications, not my control center, uh, no notifications can be responded to or reacted to. Uh, so I highly recommend you set up your iPad this way as well. And then finally, on the bottom of the list, we have the erase data setting. Now, what this means is that if someone types in the wrong password 10 times in a row, your iPad is automatically going to erase all of its data. Now, this is especially reassuring to have on if say ever your iPad is lost or stolen. The first thing that person is that is probably gonna try to do is brute force their way into the iPad. Uh, and while of course it would not be great to lose your iPad, ultimately what matters most is the personal data that it holds. This feature ensures it is protected. Now, if you are worried about typing in your own password incorrectly multiple times in a row, uh, this is where an iCloud backup comes in. And this is my uh, next recommendation here for the iPad. Uh, so what you can do, go ahead and tap on your name in the top left here, and you can tap on, I oh, you can tap on iCloud, there we go. And then we have the option to turn on iCloud backup. Now, depending on how large uh, or how much content you have on your iPad and how much available storage you have in your iCloud, you may need to buy more storage. For example, I have a 200 gigabyte plan with iCloud Plus. And as you can see, I have backups for both my iPhones uh, as well as my iPad, Apple Watch, things like that. Um, highly recommend doing this. I believe it is only 99 cents per month for a 50 gigabyte plan, which should be enough for iPad. Uh, and then I believe for 200 gigabytes, it is just about $3. So if you add that up, let's say $1 per month, that's $12 a year to always have an up-to-date backup of your iPad in the cloud, should you ever need it. Uh, believe me, this is super reassuring uh, and will be more than worth doing. Uh, the iPad will automatically back up every night. So any new files or changes will be updated in the background. You don't even have to think about it. Uh, so you will always have a copy that is up to date in case ever your iPad is lost or stolen buy a new iPad, restore from that backup and leave off right where you were, albeit with, well, a hole in the bank account. So those are the first things that you should do with a brand new iPad. I hope this video was helpful to you. If it was, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to see more content like this. And it also really helps support my channel. Let me know if you have any questions, guys. If you haven't seen them yet, I highly recommend watching my iPad 2023 Complete Buyer's Guide in which I compare all current models, uh, as well as my iPhone 14 Pro first 10 things to do video. A similar format to this just applied for the iPhone 14 Pro. Anyway, guys, thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.